Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the spring meeting of the Standing Committee on Offshore Wind Energy and Fisheries at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. We will get started shortly as everyone is joining the call. Good afternoon. My name is Caroline Bell. I am the project director for from the National Academies for the Standing Committee on Offshore Wind Energy and Fisheries. Welcome to our spring meeting. Um, we'll have a great agenda set aside for the next two days of meetings and glad that uh, members of the public and our committee and presenters could join us. For a little bit of background, the National Academies is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is the nation's preeminent source of expert, evidence based, and objective advice on science, engineering, and health matters. The National Academies provides independent, objective advice to inform policy with objective scientific findings, spark progress, and innovation, and confront conform challenging issues for the benefit of society. Next slide, please. As you can see on the slides are the agenda for today and tomorrow. The intention of the meeting today is to uh, receive an update on current and planned activities for offshore wind energy development around the United States, learn about the findings from a National Academy's report that was released late last year on the hydrodynamics of offshore wind energy, and to hear from about the Boehm and Bessie split rule um, on responsibilities regarding offshore wind. Next slide. Before we continue, I want to note that this is an open meeting and it is being recorded to share on our project website. I would ask that panelists and committee members mute yourself when not speaking to limit distractions and keep your video on when speaking uh, to promote a sense of community for the public that are viewing the webinar, as well as other panelists members that are participating. Please use the Q&A or chat feature to relay questions to panelists or committee members. We will, at the uh, conclusion of each presentation, allow a few minutes of questions, um, but the questions will be prioritized to our committee members um, and if time allows, we'll, we'll hear from public uh, questions as well. Um, if you enter questions into the Q&A feature or into the chat, um, staff and panelists and present and committee members uh, uh, can go through and, and answer questions while the meeting is going on. Um, and we'll take the time to get back to questions following the meeting um, as well. Um, otherwise, um, we do ask that everyone um, yep, keep muted um, and for committee members, raise your hands as you have a question and we will call on you um, to during the Q&A portions of the session. Okay, next slide, please. Here you can see the list of our committee members and we'll briefly go around um, in order listed on the slide for our committee members to introduce themselves, starting with our chair. I'll turn it over. 
Sure, thanks, Caroline. And thank you all for attending. I'm Jim Sankirico, I'm Professor of Environmental Science and Policy at the University of California, Davis, and a member of the National Academy's Ocean Studies Board. Dan? Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm remote in the path of totality in Buffalo, New York. Uh, but Daniel Doolittle, I'm a principal at Integral Consulting and uh, uh, very, very welcome to be on the committee and uh, have everyone here. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Janet Duffy Anderson, Gulf of Maine Research Institute. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer. My expertise is anthropogenic effects on fisheries dynamics, and thank you for letting me be here today. I don't think Trish is here with us today, right? So, Steve? Yeah, good morning. Uh, I'm Steve Joner. I'm uh, with the Macaw Tribe in Washington State. I'm a fishery biologist and manager, uh, very active in management of uh, the tribe's fisheries in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, very engaged in this process of determining uh, potential impacts to the tribal resources for all of the tribes on the Pacific coast that have uh, fisheries interests and cultures. Thanks. And Dan, I don't think Eric is on yet. Yeah, He's Eric said he'd be yeah. like an hour away. Anyway, Dan Kipnis, Captain Dan Kipnis, uh, ex-charter boat and commercial fisherman, and uh, I guess marine ecology activist. And it's uh, nice to see you all again. It's been a while. Hi, I'm Sarah Maxwell. I'm an associate professor at University of Washington on the Bothell campus. Um, and I have expertise in particularly animal movement um, in regards to offshore wind. Hi, I'm Stephen Cyphers. I'm an associate professor at the University of South Alabama in marine and environmental sciences and sociology. And I'm on the, the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council's SSC and work in human dimensions of fisheries. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Hi, uh, I'm Ron Smolowitz. I'm a technical consultant to the fishing industry, primarily um, now operating for the sea scallop fishery in the uh, East Coast. And Caroline, is that all? I don't see David on or Dick. Yep, that's correct. Thank you Great. everyone for the introductions. Um, also on the line, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm Caroline Bell. I'm the, the project officer for this uh, standing committee. And then we also have Safa Wayne who is uh, helping with the logistics for this study from the National Academies. Next slide, please. Before we move on to the agenda and into our regional updates, um, I did want to go over our uh, expectations for conducts. The National Academies is committed to fostering professional, respectful, and inclusive environment where all can participate fully in a harassment-free and discrimina discrimination-free atmosphere. We look to each of you to help us maintain a professional and cordial environment um, and you can see on the screen here details on the Academy's policy on preventing discrimination, harassment, and bullying um, available on the web link at the, the bottom of the page. And then with our last introductory slide, um, many of you who are joining us all probably are already signed up for our Academy's um, newsletter and what have you received a link to register for this event some other way and would like to join our newsletter to follow the activities of the standing committee. Um, you can subscribe for um, Ocean Studies Board OSB updates on the National Academy's webpage, um, or you, you can also find information about this meeting, other activities of the standing committee, standing committee and prior um, recordings for uh, prior meetings on our committee information webpage. Um, and then also receive announcements. 
after each of our speakers, as we go um, into the next session here, we'll, we will have about five minutes for questions. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, that we are going to allow committee members to ask our questions first, but we will be looking um, to public questions if there's time, and also we'll um, work to answer as many public questions through, uh, put it in the Q&A feature or the chat um, as well. So with that, I would like to turn things over now to um, begin our BOEM regional updates, and we'll start with the Atlantic region and hear from Brian Hooker. All right. Well, good uh, Good morning, good afternoon, or wherever everyone, you know, depending on everyone's uh, time zone, and um, yeah, happy happy Eclipse Day. Uh, hopefully we'll have that e Eclipse break uh, later later on in the uh later on in the afternoon as it starts to hit folks um yeah, my name is uh, Brian Hooker and I am uh the uh biology section chief in the environment branch for renewable energy uh at at Boehm. and today I was just going to give you a, a quick update on where we are with uh some of our Atlantic renewable activities so let me go ahead and there we go already introduced myself. Um, so some of the things I wanted to highlight today were uh, where we are with some of the planning area analyses, uh, both in the Central Atlantic and the Gulf of Maine, and then kind of a project by project snapshot. We have a lot of active uh, construction operation plan reviews and um, and also the, uh, the where we are with the New York Bite programmatic environmental impact statement. So here again is just kind of a of, of a snapshot for uh, some of the, the pre-lease issuance uh, because we're gonna do some of that planning area level stuff um, uh, at the beginning of, of, of the slides. So, um, you know, so basically for Central Atlantic and, uh, and Gulf of Maine is where we're, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it, we're kind of nearing, nearing the end of that area identification uh, phase and we're entering the the environmental review for for lease issuance, uh, and then which follows then with a proposed and and final sale notice. So in in the Gulf of Maine, we announced that final wind energy area uh, just recently on March fifteenth. Um, it is at the area in green uh, on the screen. It's approximately two million acres, and if anyone was following the um, the initial you know call area. Uh, process and the uh, draft wind energy area process. That was a an eighty. We, we follow a, a winnowing process from where we initially started the review for uh, most of the uh, mm -hmm. the entirety of the Gulf of Maine, and then um, so this area here represents an eighty percent reduction from the call area and a further a forty three percent reduction from the draft wind energy area. And I definitely appreciated everyone who supplied comments um, as we went along in that in that process. So we are currently working on an environmental assessment uh, for lease issuance. And uh, the next step is a, uh, you know, trying to determine, uh, you know, potential lease areas within the wind energy area that you see here and uh, a proposed sale notice uh, following that. Uh, where we are with the central and the central Atlantic, so re moving moving down the coast a ways. Um, so we uh, published a, a proposed sale notice uh, at the end of last year in, in December. Uh, the comment period on that proposed sale notice uh, uh, closed on February February twenty February twelfth, um, and then we're anticipating um, a lease sale uh, this summer. And so what you can see here is um, the basically the the two areas uh, that are colored in the A and the C are what are moving forward uh, at this at this phase for um, for the auction, and the outline, uh, the gray outline of B, D, E, and F, are areas that uh, were uh, in the initial um, wind energy area development call area process that um, we're setting aside for, for now. Um, the grade in um, features are actual existing, uh, existing lease areas. 
So now I want to kind of move into the actual lease areas. Uh, so these are areas that we have leased that are active leases uh, where we are, they're either in a site assessment um, period um, or they're actually in a construction operations development and or construction operations review um, period. So on, on the left panel uh, is, is the Northeast projects middle is the mid-atlantic and then on the far on the right is the southeast projects and that's how i'll kind of um go through the, the next couple slides with my quick snapshots of where we are because there's there's definitely a lot going on so for vineyard wind one uh that project was approved and construction has begun and is continuing uh for south fork wind farm that uh that one was approved and construction is actually complete that's the uh the first, I think, commercial scale project that is uh, completed construction uh, on the OCS. Uh, as a reminder, we did have two demonstration scale projects that I didn't include here, uh, which was the uh, Block Island Wind Farm project, which is actually in state waters, and the uh, CVAO, the, the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Research Project off Virginia, which have been up and running for, for a few years now. Uh, where we are now with the next one is Revolution Wind. Uh, that one is approved and construction is beginning, uh, uh, supposed to begin this year. Uh, Sunrise Wind Farm, uh, we just completed the uh, final environmental impact statement and the record of decision. The New England Wind uh, Project, which comprises both the Park City and, and Commonwealth projects, uh, the FEIS is complete and we just published that uh, final environmental impact statement. And the next few are in earlier stages of that environmental review. So for South Coast, um, environmental review is underway for the COP. Uh, Beacon Wind environmental review is underway. Um, <clears throat> Vineyard Northeast is uh, just getting started. We're, uh, next week, we have our uh, first uh, public meetings on, on that, on, on that uh, construction operations plan. And uh, lastly, uh, Bay State Wind, uh, the COP is currently under revision. So we haven't initiated the environmental, public environmental review through NEPA yet for, for that one. Uh, moving to the Mid-Atlantic, the Ocean Wind Project uh, was approved, but then we um, suspended that project uh, for, for two years um, while they evaluate what the next steps are for, for that project. Uh, the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind Project uh, was approved and construction is beginning uh, this summer. Uh, the Empire Wind Project was uh, recently approved. Uh, the Atlantic Shores South uh, Project, we actually have uh, public meetings uh, this week for Atlantic Shores. No, excuse me, that was Atlantic Shores North uh, is this week. Atlantic Shores South, the environmental review is, is underway and it's actually nearing the, nearing the end. Uh, U.S. Wind Maryland is also uh, nearing the end of their environmental review. Atlantic Shores, Atlantic Shores North, that's uh, that's the one that's having public meetings this week. And uh, New York Bite, um, I mentioned I'll, on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about uh, this programmatic EIS that we're we're doing for the New York Bite leases, and that includes uh, the projects listed here: Community Wind, Ocean Winds East, Atlantic Shores Bite. Etc. For uh, for the there's a grouping of of, of lease areas in, in New York Bight, and lastly Skipjack, um, which is further down off of the uh, Maryland Delaware coast, is at the uh, still in the COP stage. Um, <clears throat> in the South Atlantic, we have two projects, uh, both Duke Energies and Total uh, Energies Renewables. Uh, both of those are in the site assessment phase, so just beginning to understand the. Uh, the site characterization, characterize the site, and understand the uh, the wind resources. So, as I mentioned, here's the uh, close up of those New York bite leases I, I mentioned a minute ago. Um, what we decided, uh, kind of a novel approach that we took with these, is to do a programmatic EIS, and the programmatic EIS is meant to look at. Um, um, uh, mitigation measures that might be applicable across all the projects and to try to really develop a standard of of how those projects will be um, will be informed through both um, you know standardized mitigation measures across all the projects and and general best management practices 
that these projects uh, can do. The, um, there, there will be individual EISs, just as we do with every other project at that at the COP uh, review phase. So that that will come after uh, we conclude the programmatic EIS, which we're actively working on right now. The comment up period on that closed just uh, just recently in February twenty sixth. And lastly, I can't end any presentation without mentioning our studies development plan. Um, just as a reminder to folks uh, that uh, if you are involved in the another National Academies group, the uh, the COSA group, who helps advise on on these, um, here's a uh, just some really some recent work that we're we're continuing to do on uh, squid and black sea bass acoustics. Uh, the the completed study here is one that was more of a uh, tank based study that was conducted in both Woods Hole and uh, and the uh, uh, JJ, Howard, JJ Howard Lab in New Jersey. Uh, we do have a continuation of that study that is uh, getting wrapped up that was more in situ testing off of in, in Woods Hole. And then just an example of some continuing studies that we have looking at um, uh, the different settlement rates and different types of attraction um, or, or utilization of, of different uh, materials that are used in offshore wind uh, construction uh, going on on the Atlantic and off of Virginia. And then in Southern New England, we have a, a connectivity study uh, looking at not only, we have a lot of studies that look at like how around a particular foundation, um, you know, there's changes in abundances or or um, uh, or, or just uh, presence absence of different fish species. But uh, this, this study is meant to look at connectivity between um, between uh, turbines or animals moving back and forth between turbines um, or are they there's a, is there a lot of site fidelity or are they moving and foraging you know outside of that area or going to other uh, resource areas so that one's uh, ongoing as well so that's that's it for me I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, any questions or uh, that you might have now or, or we can do that at the conclusion of all the uh, regional updates thanks Brian I think we'll take uh, so we have some time to take questions now. I will also say for those of you coming on, uh, surprisingly, maybe we are ahead of schedule. So Brian uh, went first, so we might have a little bit more time for questions. Sarah? Um, I thought we were going to have Steve start. Or is, that, is that a different session? Yes, different session. Different session. Okay. Um, the question I had was, could you say again what the, the difference between the programmatic EIS and the regular EIS is, and then why the South Bite is the only one that was South Bite that that's uh, that has a programmatic EIS? Yeah. No, that's a, that's a that's a great question. I think we've had a lot of uh, you know public interest in how to how do we evaluate um, projects at a at a programmatic level, and it's and it's challenging to do to do that uh, for a variety of reasons, because each project is, is very specific and they have you know different project parameters depending on, on where they are. So when we had uh, the New York Bite where we were issuing uh, several leases, uh, an, an auction for several leases at, at the same time, um, we felt there was an opportunity to, um, to, to look at things programmatically and where we ended up, um, what we ended up doing is looking at it from the, uh, point of view of like, you know, these pro there should these projects should all have like the same standards moving forward and and how they um, you know how how they're developed. So the what we affectionately term the A triple M's the um, the uh, programmatic uh, mitigation measures is the programmatic document that we chose to to do to kind of evaluate. Uh, more holistically, all those projects uh, prior to them entering in their individual uh, COP assessments. So at this point, we do not have um, the the programmatic uh, EIS. Um, basically, has a lot of assumptions about what the projects may look like. Have you know various uh, broad project parameters and looks at things really at a super high level. Uh, you know more so than what we have when we actually receive a construction and operations plan where we have you know very specifics about you know um where they where they might want to have the cable landfall where 
uh, what types of foundations they're 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 really considering the the turbine um, parameters and and so forth. So when we get to that actual COP, we're evaluating that actual project versus evaluating um, measures that would be applicable to projects in that area. Okay, so the, in this case, it's because they're pro in proximity; they're so close. Is that kind of what? That was part of it. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, I mean. There wouldn't necessarily, you know, be a a reason why uh, we couldn't do something, you know, programmatically for other projects, but because a lot of other times, as you saw with like the the Gulf of Maine or uh, the Central Atlantic, you know, those are just like you know two projects at a time. Uh, Gulf of Maine, we're still trying to figure out how many leases that would be in the first first lease sale, but a lot of times we've only been uh, having auctions for you know one or two. Projects, so they didn't necessarily lend themselves to being, um, you know, needing a programmatic analysis because they're, you know, those those auctions, those sale dates have been separated in time and space, and maybe were, um, you know, smaller smaller projects. But that that New York bike lease was, um, a, you know, uh, different in in that it had so many projects that are so many lease areas as a part of part of that lease sale. Okay, great, thank you. I understand now. Janet? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I appreciate that. I'm going to ask you a question that you may or may not be able to comment on, but um, just yeah, try your best. I noticed uh, the other day Vineyard Wind released its fisheries compens compensatory mitigation uh, program, and it specifically um, indicates that owner operators should apply, and it uh, calls out that there will be um, another call specifically for shoreside, shoreside operations. What I don't see in the call is anything about through, and I'm wondering if you could if you could comment on that sort of what's the protocol and and the thinking there. Yeah, I think what I'll I can best I can do is is talk about this how we how we've talked about it in our um, development of our draft fisheries mitigation guidance, which I think we might be even talking about uh, later. But um, generally, the the idea is that the the vessel owner operator is is the one point where we have what that X vessel value is. They're the ones that, uh, they are the business that's operating and the, the crew would be, you know, like employees of that business. So it's it's then that business is responsibility. I think if um, there there were, you know, uh, employees that it that it has that need to be potentially compensated for for their time, that could be part of what what they do with whatever compensation funds uh, they receive. Again, this is through my experience in working with the uh, with the with the mitigation guidance and why we didn't necessarily call out, um, you know, a specific uh, you know separate crew because you could have them, you know, potentially double counting where a crew member is seeking compensation for something that the owner is already being compensated for because they're they're basing that on their um, you know, the gross uh, landings receipts. Thanks. So can you, just a one follow-up question, have you gotten any feedback on that process from previous calls? Um, we, we definitely received a lot of, uh, a lot of comments uh, as part of the draft, the, the draft fisheries mitigation guidance uh, that concluded uh, over a year ago. Um, and uh, I, I, we have, I, that was, I think all those are on regulations.gov. Um, and I can share a, and the link uh, where those where those comments are located on the the fisheries mitigation guidance. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I appreciate that. That'd be helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dan. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Brian, um, if you don't mind, just going back to the programmatic discussion a little bit. Um, you know, now that it's been issued and you're starting to see cops come in and um, I've, and the team is is grown a little bit on in the Bohm's Atlantic office, I'd be curious if you could speak to efficiencies and benefits that you're seeing um, from the programmatic approach. And then the follow up question is, will those benefits and lessons learned and tweaks be expected to um be exported to the California process and the programmatic that's happening there. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely, even ab even outside the programmatic uh, consultation, I think we're definitely starting to, you know, begin to, you know, see some trends and some standards that um, 
that that we're seeing that I think we're we're trying to encapsulate in the programmatic. Um, you know, saying here here's some standard, definitely some standard things, some best management practices, some standard terms and conditions that that we see, and um, it is uh, is improving uh, with with each project. But I'll also say that it's it's we only have now two projects, two commercial scale projects um, that that just recently kind of finished that, you know, that kind of a lot, there's a lot of post cop reports and reporting and saying, okay, how do these different conditions work? What do we actually see uh, constructed in the field? And so I think we're going to see, continue to see a slight evolution and tweaking of some of these terms and conditions as we continue to learn from the actual building. So what we have right now is lessons learned from the, um, you know our environmental review environmental review process mm -hmm. and you know developing enforceable terms and conditions of cop approval but then the next iteration will be okay what do we see um on the ground and how can those um measures be improved based on what we're actually seeing um on the water uh so i hope that answers your question it, it is it is inclusive of of the programmatic too i think we, we definitely look at that programmatic being this is a way for us to kind of focus and, and, and show the public where where kind of some of the standards are evolving because a lot of times in the environmental review process for a specific project that all those mitigations are are in a final appendix and they're they're part of the the whole environmental review but oftentimes you're focused on the project parameters in the environmental review as as a public but this is an opportunity just to focus on the um the the mitigation measures themselves and, and uh, programmatic so I hope that's helpful. It, it, it is. I was just curious if you could also speak a little bit to um, either planned or existing processes for sharing uh, experience and support. You know, that iterative learning that's been happening in the whole industry. Um, you know, we're we, we, we're almost feeling like or we're seeing like it's starting again on the on the West Coast, almost yeah. new and fresh. And just just curious how we can best capture some yeah, of those no. uh, we're, opportunities. We're, yeah, we're definitely sharing uh, sharing our lessons learned uh, both with the Gulf and in the Pacific. We have a regular, uh, you know, inner region calls and discussions on on things we can uh, um, uh, work on work on together. And 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 again, the lessons learned aspect. There are some unique, you know, aspects to both the Gulf and the Pacific that are a little bit different. Uh, for instance, uh, the Pacific will probably be the leader in floating uh, compared to the Atlantic. Uh, which has its own set of uh, unique um, um, challenges. So uh, we we might be actually be in the, on the receiving end um, uh, from the Pacific uh, on on floating. Great, thank you, Brian. There's a I know tomorrow we're going to be talking about the uh, fisheries mitigation, but there is a quick question from the outside our group about the timeline. Do you happen to know what that is? And then after that, I think we'll move on to Bridget. Yeah, great. We're um, my my goal is to uh, have it done by the, the by the end of this calendar year. The the final the final guidance. Um, we're actively working on it as as fast as we can to 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 get that out. Um, but it, you know there is a lot of other projects that are that are active at the same time. So balancing that is. Uh, a, a challenge and that's our, our goal by the end of the year. Great. Thank you very much. Bridget. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my slides. Great. Can you see them? But hi, everyone. My name is Melody Program in the Gulf of Mexico region. Uh, my section is in responsible for all of the conventional renewable energy sales. And we are in New Orleans, so we will not be seeing any of the eclipse because it is completely dark with clouds. <laughs> So today I wanted to share with you a little bit of a background on how we got to our first Gulf of Mexico wind sail. Um, then we'll dive into our second, our proposed second Gulf of Mexico wind sail. Our proposed sail notice was recently 
published. So we'll go over a little bit about the uh, proposed leases and um, that process, as well as some upcoming outreach that we have planned within our region. So turning back the clock a little bit on our Gulf of Mexico Wind One process, uh, we did partner with NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, or NCOS. We utilize their marine spatial planning tool, um, and that helped us to deconflict 13 wind energy area options in the Gulf of Mexico region for our first lease sale. Through um, stakeholder outreach, task force meetings, tribal outreach, we um, where we decided to move forward with only area we options I and M for this first lease sale. B that you see here with um, the little yellow asterisks uh, was removed later due to some DOD assessment. Um, they requested removal of that area. So that leaves us with 11 wind energy area options to move forward uh, with a potential Gulf of Mexico wind two sale. So for Gulf of Mexico wind one, uh, we did a precision siting model with NCOS in order to find the best or most deconflicted spaces within those two final wind energy areas uh, of I and M. So you can see here that we had three lease areas that were proposed, um, that were offered within Gulf of Mexico wind one. We have Galveston one in yellow, Galveston two in orange, and the Lake Charles lease area in red. Um, so all three of those did move forward in our final sale notice and were offered for the first Gulf of Mexico sale. Our first sale was held August 29th of last year. We had two companies that bid in the sale. Um, they both bid on the Lake Charles lease area, which was the one in red. And so that lease um, went for 5.6 million and was won by RWE Offshore US Gulf LLC and their lease became effective on November 1st of last year. So at the close of that uh, lease sale, we started to look forward to um, a potential Gulf of Mexico win two sale. And as I said, we only went forward with WIA I and M. Um, so we went back to the drawing board and looked at the 11 remaining WIA options that we had left on the table from our first sale. Um, so we took a look at, at all of these. We did some additional stakeholder outreach and some data gathering to make sure that the data that we had for Gulf of Mexico win one in our modeling system was the best and uh, most recent data and uh, made any tweaks to that model that we that needed to be made. So our Gulf of Mexico win two, we decided to move forward with four uh, final wind energy areas. So those four will join WIA I, as you remember, uh, was in the first Gulf of Mexico wind sale. Um, so that remained a final WIA. And now we are adding J, K, L, and N uh, as final wind energy areas, as potential um, spaces that we could look further into for a second sale. And you can see here on the graph how those relate to the lease um, that was awarded, and that's the one in blue. We then did the same precision siting model uh, with NCOS to find the most deconflicted spaces within those potential WIAs, within the final WIAs. Um, I remains the same as the lease areas that were offered in Gulf of Mexico in one. And then in our proposed sale notice, uh, we released two other lease areas um, that we are proposing to offer in a second sale. And so you'll see those um, in purple to the right of I. So we have J1 and K1 will be the other two um, that are proposed to be offered. This proposed notice was released on March 21st, 21st of this year. So diving into these lease areas a little bit more, um, this is I-1. It is the same as when um, it was offered in the first Gulf of Mexico wind sale. We didn't have any bids on this at the time, uh, but we have received multiple inquiries from companies um, submitting unsolicited lease requests for this particular area. Um, those have been closed and we are moving forward, um, uh, including this in a second Gulf sale. Same for I-2, it's 96,000 acres, it's to the south of I-1. 
Um, so this is one of the new uh, proposed lease area. This is J1. It is about 108,000 acres and is about 75 uh, kilometers from Texas. And then for K1, this one is equidistant really between Louisiana and Texas, and it is about 102,000 acres. So in total, uh, we are proposing to offer 410,000 acres um, for a Gulf of Mexico uh, second wind energy sale. For our proposed sale notice, we are asking um, a few questions for stakeholders um, to comment. We have a 60 day comment period on this proposed sale notice. So some of the questions that we are specifically calling out um, are uh, we would like input on the delineation, the number, size, orientation, and, and location of the lease areas that we are proposing to offer. We're looking for input, input on the need for transit corridors through these leases, benefits to underserved communities, as well as the bidding credits. So in our proposed sale notice, we do propose the, uh, the two bidding credits. Um, they are the same that were in Gulf of Mexico Wing 1, and those are the workforce training and supply chain development and the fishery compensatory mitigation fund. We're also um, seeking feedback on our engagement and reporting requirements, as well as the prescribed layouts uh, of the lease areas. We're also looking for feedback on the limits on the number of lease areas uh, per bidder, as well as the industry standards for environmental protection. So if you'd like to make a comment on our proposed sale notice, if you have any feedback, the way you can do that is on regulations.gov. This docket number is BOEM 2024-0017. And like I said, we have a 60-day comment period ongoing right now. And so we're accepting comments through May 20th. So during the 60-day comment period, we have a few outreach um, uh, meetings planned. So actually this Wednesday, we have, we're hosting our auction seminar and that is for prospective bidders to learn more about our auction software. We'll also be going over, um, you know, items that are included in our proposed sale notice. April 18th is our fifth intergovernmental task force. Um, it's a virtual meeting. Um, task force members um, can comment during the beginning of the meeting. However, there is a one hour public comment period at the end of the meeting. So you're welcome um, to register if you're not a member of the task force that we will be accepting um, comments at the end of that meeting. And then April 30th, we are planning a fisheries and ENGO engagement virtual meeting um, that you'll be able to register on our website at the link below in the one in green. And I can put that in the chat too, um, if you're interested. We don't have the um, the link up yet, um, but we will be announcing that meeting soon. The next steps for our Gulf of Mexico win two, uh, we will analyze all the comments that we receive on the PSN, decide if there need to be any edits to the lease areas. We'll publish a final sale notice that we'll talk about the date um, of that particular sale. And then the lease auction will be held um, at least uh, 30 days after the publication of the FSN. Um, these, any leases that result from the second wind sale um, would have to be signed by December 20th of 2024. That is end. This is my email address and phone number if you have any extra questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so we'll open up to questions. And again, those of you who have come on, we are ahead of schedule. So we went through our second of three speakers in this session already. And so we have a little bit more time for question and answers. And I think I don't see any hands raising quickly. So I'm going to take prerogative and ask you a question. I'm curious about uh, in the siting of the lease areas, you were talking about how are you using NCOS's tool about, you know, trying to minimize the potential conflict. Yeah. And I haven't looked at that tool in a number of years, but my understanding is it doesn't take into account that once you start to remove areas that that could lead to changes in where conflicts could occur in the future, right? So as you take, for example, one lease area out, 
that could lead to responses of users to go into the other lease areas. And NCOS's model wouldn't capture that potential spillover. Is that actually the case? And then are you how are you guys thinking about those kinds of dynamic effects in this yeah. process? Yeah, I, I I do see your point, and and you are you are correct on that for this particular model. However, I think that's why we're continuing our partnership with NCOS from each lease sale to lease sale. So before we started to look at Gulf of Mexico win two sales, um, those you know the the area that was taken into account or was leased in our first sale was removed, and we took a look at see if we had needed any data refresh and if the model needed to be tweaked at all. Um, in order for us to move forward with the second sale. So we're trying to do that, I guess you say manually almost, but you know, we are um, you know, taking into account lease areas that were already being leased. Now in the Gulf of Mexico right now, there's only one lease. So it's not um, the huge area that's been leased, but um, you know, I, I know in the future it could get more crowded and, and become more of an issue. So Steve, before you jump in, there's actually a question that sort of follows up on what I just asked. It's talking about the sort of biological productivity is not also in that, in the NCOS model. Um, so maybe, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about that before opening it to Steve? Sure. Is there a specific question just asking if it's being, if, that, if that's in the model? Yeah, that's right. They're talking about what kind of biological information is included in your uh, determining of the lease areas. Yeah, sure. So in the, the first lease sale, there are 52 layers that were uh, data layers that were included in that model, several of which were biological layers. Um, I don't know all of them off the top of my head, um, but we do have a report and I can put the link into the chat that lists all the layers that were used that were considered. Um, and that's definitely something that we want feedback on as well for our second sale. It's one of the reasons why we're doing a lot of outreach to see if there's additional data that uh, that anyone has that could be included in future rounds of the modeling. So um, definitely open to input for that. And I'll put a link in the chat for the um, our modeling uh, report. Great. Thank you very much. Steve? Yeah, thank you so much for the, the presentation. So my question was related to your, your last slide when you mentioned moving from the, the public comment period into analyzing the comments and, and considering changes that could be possibly made. So I was just hoping you could talk a little bit more about how the public comments are, are analyzed and how they may play a role with other pieces of information uh, on any changes that, that may or may not be made. Yeah, sure. So we do rely heavily on our public comments that we receive during this proposed sale notice period. Um, as they come in, um, you know, they go to regulations.gov, we download every comment and we enter them into a, a spreadsheet. Those uh, The spreadsheet's been shared with our subject matter experts and our leadership as well. And we will uh, provide responses to comments and also figure out if any of those comments, you know, we need to consider, um, you know, any alterations to the, the lease areas as we move forward. Um, if it's data we didn't know about or other considerations that we hadn't thought of, you know, anything that needs to be removed, um, you know, we'll make that our leadership makes that decision as we move forward. Great, thanks. Brian, you have your hand up. Thanks. You know, I was just going to comment uh, to your, uh, you know, because we all use NC the NCOS uh, model in, in, in all the regions, and, and I'm impressed with uh, Bridget, of course, uh, remembers how many layers are in the, the Gulf. She probably can tell you how many were layers were in the uh, Central Atlantic, too. But um, I, I just wanted to emphasize that, yeah, this is just one tool. Like, we can take any other information as part of the, you know, that we want to consider as part of the area identification process. You know, we were identifying areas before we had the partnership with INCOS. INCOS is just providing that extra layer of, you know, coordination, transparency, and how all the layers were were considered. But if there is information about, um, you know, that that isn't able to be ingested, you know, through that in-cost model for whatever reason, we can still consider that in our in our area identification process. I think we do have a challenge, um, you know, trying to understand either, uh, you know, if, uh, future uh, movement of, of where fish, uh, the center of biomass might be for different fish stocks, you know, moving 
you know, 20, 30, 50 years out, or even human behavior, you know, where, where uh, human activity might change over that same period of time. So uh, those are, those are interesting uh, challenges in, in that uh, area identification process, but thank you. Thanks for the clarification, Brian. Carolyn, do you see any questions that I'm missing out? Um, no, think, nothing else has uh, come through on the Q&A. And I think I've been taking care of things on chat. Nothing, uh, yeah. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much, Bridget. Okay. So, Abby? Hi. So I'm seeing it in, uh, not in, okay, there we go. Great, thank you. Okay, um, thank you for inviting the Pacific Region to provide an update today. Um, my name is Abigail Ryder and I'm a program analyst in Bone Pacific Region. I'm presenting for Ingrid Bidron, who's a marine biologist and she's our region's fisheries subject matter expert. So if I'm not able to answer any questions you have, I'll be sharing her email at the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. In my presentation, I'll provide a high-level update of the Boehm Pacific region's current work. We're engaged in work beyond the scope of these topic areas, but for the sake of time, I'll focus on these topics. Um, so offshore wind leasing in California, the programmatic environmental impact statement for the five offshore wind leases in California, wind energy area identification and its associated environmental assessment, and environmental studies along the Pacific Outer Continental Shelf. Next slide, please. BOEM is managing federal oversight authority on five existing leases in California, two in Northern California, offshore Humboldt County, and three in Central California near Morro Bay. Next slide, please. BOEM and the state of California began planning in 2016, as shown on the left of the slide in the brown rectangle. Environmental assessments for leasing related activities for Humboldt and Mora Bay, shown in purple, were completed in 2022, leading to the December 2022 lease sale. The leases were executed in June 2023, um, shown in blue. We are now in the site assessment phase, which is at the red arrow. And here, lessees will submit communications plans, survey plans, and site assessment plans. After BOEM reviews and approves the plans, survey plans, and site after BOEM reviews and approves the plans, lessees can then begin surveys of their lease areas, which can take up to five years. Several lessees are expected to begin surveys in 2024. And we have links to the lessee websites on our Bone California page, which is www.bone.gov slash California. Next slide, please. We're concurrently working on a high level or programmatic review to better understand potential project impacts at a larger regional scale. And as um, Brian stated in the Atlantic PEIS, the goal is to conduct a regional programmatic analysis, which will help us identify, analyze, and adopt potential mitigation measures. So the programmatic EIS includes a high level analysis of potential impacts that are not project specific and considers mitigation measures that could be applied across all five leases. Later, once BOEM has received and reviewed the construction and operations plans, the COPS from the developers, there will be project and site-specific environmental reviews of the COPS. And that's where more specific information along the lines of turbine type, their locations, landfalls um, will be available. Um, more information is available about the PEIS at www.boem.gov slash CA offshore wind PEIS and that last bit, CA Offshore Wind PEIS, that's all one word. Um, but you can also find a link to the PEIS from the BOEM California page. Next slide, please. BOEM coordinated with the state of Oregon and collaborated with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Centers for Ocean Ocean Science, that's NCOS, 
Um, so we also use the ocean sp spatial planning model in Oregon, which seeks to identify and minimize conflicts. So this comprehensive process enabled BOEM to identify potential offshore locations that appear most suitable for floating offshore wind energy leasing and potential development. Taking into consideration potential impacts to local coastal and marine resources and ocean users. As a result of using this process, the two wind energy areas that we identified avoided 98% of the areas that the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife recommended for exclusion due to conflicts with commercial fishing. So the area ID memo and the NCOS report, which details the comprehensive process is available on our Oregon page at www.bone.gov slash Oregon. Next slide, please. This slide shows the BOEM authorization process and where we are for Oregon. So as I said, we recently completed the area identification phase and we're now in the process of developing the environmental assessment with public involvement. Our current schedule is to publish the draft DA by the end of the month, incorporate public comment this spring concurrently with the Oregon CZMA process for a final EA by the end of the summer. Um, but there's a caveat that timelines are always shifting. As shown on the slide, um, BOEM is aiming for a fall lease sale. Next slide, please. The BOEM has funded and participated in numerous studies to collect information about the marine environment to support decisions concerning offshore renewable energy development. Um, so, since the inception of BOEM's environmental studies program, um, we've conducted more than 330 Pacific studies. Many of these studies have been conducted to inform decisions about oil and gas development on the California OCS, but regional study priorities have expanded lately to address information needs regarding renewable energy development throughout the Pacific. And on the next slide, I'll um, give you some examples of recent fisheries related studies. So next slide. Um, so the first study, a recent study, facilitating resilience and adaptation in commercial fisheries in response to offshore renewable energy development and climate change. So VOM is funding this study because impact analysis for commercial fishing often focuses on short-term negative effects and neglects to elucidate the long-term and potentially beneficial aspects of offshore renewable energy development. It is challenging to understand, predict, and mitigate potential consequences of renewable energy leases in light of how climate change may interact with potential effects of a proposed offshore renewable energy project. Um, the next study, um, Port in in Infrastructure Needs of Commercial and Recreational Fisheries Along the U.S. West Coast, will help BOEM understand how renewable energy development may affect other port-based industries, especially commercial fishing. And the third study I'm gonna talk about, traditional native Hawaiian voyaging and cultural fishing and boating practices on the OCS. So this study helps to inform floating offshore wind environmental analyses and section 106 consultations, and will help BOEM understand potential impacts of offshore wind to traditional native Hawaiian voyaging activities and current cultural fishing activities. So Hawaii, Hawaii is, as Hawaii undergoes a transformation to move from being almost completely reliant on imported fossil fuels to one that is powered by clean renewable energy. All right, next slide, please. Um, so we're always happy to hear from you. So please don't hesitate to reach out to Ingrid or myself with questions. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you, Abigail. Um, I think the, our first speaker is Steve, for response. Yeah, thanks, Abigail. Um, I'm uh, with the Macaw Tribe in Washington State, and um, we've been very active in, in dealing with BOEM. And uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, so the first one is about the, the PEIS for the five California lease areas. Um, there's a lot of concern by folks uh, up uh, north of California in Washington and Oregon 
Uh, the tribes in particular are concerned about the cumulative impact that not just those five lease areas, but all of the uh, future plan and future lease areas will have on the uh, resources, fisheries resources uh, uh, within the California current ecosystem. And uh, as you probably are aware, uh, the tribes in Northern Washington harvest species that uh, originate or migrate through California and, and could be uh, greatly impacted. So, you know, we wanna be sure that that is part of the the PEIS. And actually the, the impacts go all the way to Canada. The U.S. has uh, treaties for uh, a number of uh, transboundary species with Canada, uh, including Pacific whiting. And so the U.S. has uh, obligations there. And so that's the first question. Then the second one is, uh, I attended the uh, West Coast Ocean Alliance uh, Tribal Offshore Wind Summit uh, last week in uh, Sacramento. Um, I went partly because I was asked to come and and uh, uh, give a report on on uh, our committee here and also the work I've done through the uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council's Marine Planning Committee. So uh, I. I was aware that there are a number of tribes uh, south of uh, the, well, in Southern Oregon and in California <clears throat> who were uh, very concerned about uh, the, the development of offshore wind energy off of California. Um, I, I wasn't surprised by their concern, but I was, I was kind of struck by how engaged they were in it. And um so I, I think that the common the common theme of of their concerns was that Boehm has not adequately conducted meaningful consensus based uh, consultation with the tribes and um, the view by I believe every tribe present was that uh, Boehm has failed to work with the tribes as equal partners, which is the only way to achieve meaningful consultation. So uh, that, that's partly a statement, a uh, comment, but uh, partly a question, uh, can Boehm correct this? And I think the, the level of concern has been expressed by the, that at first, tribes were asking Boehm to pause, to slow down, uh, to adequately address the tribal concerns and to reach consensus. And then the next, the next uh, stage was uh, asking Boehm to, to suspend activities. And now there are a number of tribes who have come out openly opposed to this offshore wind development. So how, how can you do that? How can you correct this and get Boehm on the right track so that uh, mistakes that have been made in the past in energy development and uh, other other areas that have had such great impact to tribes that that won't be repeated. Okay, um, so your first question about the PEAS, um, I'm gonna try and rephrase a little bit. I think it was about um, the concern of making sure that all cumulative impacts are addressed. And when we're determining how to define the PEIS, we have to kind of define the geographic area. And there has been um, you know, discussion on how broad to define the geographic area. The reason the decision was made to um, really focus on the five lease areas is um, because we're, we're taking a, a programmatic approach that is sort of um, dictated by the timing of events. So um, these five leases are happening now and in the future, if other leases occur, it may be other technology, which means we would be looking at different, um, uh, something called a project design envelope. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be, it would be, it would become too speculative. You would end up with a project that is so speculative that it would almost 
be meaningless. So when you when you're trying to define something, you have to put limits. Um, but that that is definitely something that you know we're 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 keeping in mind, and we're trying to kind of find that the happy balance between um, you know having a regional approach and having to have by definition boundaries to the project. Um, in terms of your second question, I know that's a, um, something that has been brought up directly to our regional director, Doug Boren. So um, I'm a little hesitant to, to address that question myself because I think that's, that's sort of a response that's perhaps above my pay grade, but I'm happy to take your concerns back to um, my, the office. Uh, okay, th thank you for that. Um, I guess with uh, respect to the first question of PEIS, and that is that uh, you keep the tribes engaged as you're developing that so that, uh, you know, what can be done will be done. You know, I understand the speculative concern, um, but we don't want to get too far down the road on this uh, and, and have to go go back and, and revisit, correct? So... Uh, and right. and that's what I, I I fully understand the you know the situation there and and uh, Director Bourne fully knows it but I'm just uh, uh, reemphasizing that that is a problem that must be corrected. Mm -hmm. Yep, and and I will say on the PEIS, I mean we've had um, a lot of conversations and you know we put out a request um, for cooperating agencies and cooperating tribal partners and. Um, we're in discussion um, with with different partners on how to proceed with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, I have a call. Thanks, Steve. Dan? Great. Um, Abigail, thank, thank you for the presentation. And uh, it's an excellent um, update and excited to see Oregon uh, coming along for a, a proposed sale this year. So that's just kudos for that and the, the effort that the West Coast staff is putting forward. I, I have I have two questions if if you can if you can address them or maybe somebody on the BOEM team can. Question one is just is there an update on the SAP modernization rule? Um, you know, as it would apply to the West Coast developments. So that's that's question one. And apologies for the, the background noise. Um, happy to repeat anything. Uh, the second question would would be around um, asking if the environmental assessment is is being revised or being looked at with respect to um, the, the the scope of technologies, the scope of resolutions, the scope of number of buoys uh, that were considered in the original EA. Um, just any any comments you could make about. Bohm's activities around uh, potential revision of the EA. Okay. Thank you. Um, on your, your first question, I'm not sure about the, how the modernization rule applies to Pacific yet. So that would be something I would have to take back to the office. Uh, Abby, um, we so, have. But maybe Brian has some answers. We, um, Frank, uh, right, Frank, who's, who's here for the later discussion on the. Um, uh, the decommissioning question uh, is with our policy office who can answer that, Abby, after you're done with answering the second part. Okay, awesome. Um, and then on your, your second question about the EA, were you, just so I wanna make sure we're talking about the same thing. Are you talking about the Oregon EA or are you talking about the California environmental so, Im impact? Sorry, EA? California, California specifically, yep. Thank you, okay. thank you. I should have made that clear. <laughs> yeah, no, it, believe me, even in our office, we always have to check ourselves. Make, um, so um, can you, and can you repeat the question one more time? Sure, it's, it's, it's more of a conversational question just about, um, it, you know, you know it, are there going to be any revisions or is there a mechanism, a permitting mechanism to, uh, look at um, 
some of the parameters that were that were assumed in the in the California EA. For example, the number of buoys uh, that were going to be in the lease areas, uh, the application of performance standards for autonomous underwater vehicles uh, versus all mounted uh, geophysical equipment for okay, you know, so collecting data, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so the, the EA was specifically looking at uh, site assessment and site characterization activities. Um, so, and then the PEIS is a little bit broader. We do have something called the project design envelope, which has a bunch of parameters, and we've been working. Um, we've been working with NREL um, to figure out what those the range of parameters for for that will be. Um, and so those are looking th like, for example, you know, like um, for a turbine, you need to consider turbines of this height to this height. So it's a range of parameters. Um, so I'm not sure specifically in terms of like number of buoys, if that's one of the parameters in the RDPE, but we are looking at a whole bunch of different technological, technical specifications. And so the RDPE will be one of the, like will be an appendix in the, the draft PEIS. Um, so we have a, basically we have a Pacific specific RDPE for floating in the way that the New York bite had a RDPE that's specific for those um, con conditions in the Atlantic. Does that sort of get to what you're asking? Um, it, it is, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, I can jump in um, on and the, the, the question of modernization room. Um, the, and, Hi everybody, my name is Wright Frank. Um, the modernization rule uh, was published in proposed form and the final has not been published yet. Uh, we're talking about our regulations, which are national in application. So what, what we publish there will apply to California equally as well as anywhere else. Um, I, I can talk a little bit about the proposed, but uh, but we're we're supposed to be radio silent on the final as we're you know trying to treat all of the community, all, all of the public equally, so everybody has the same information. But um, we had proposed not to be requiring site a site assessment plan for the deployment of a buoy, which would mean that if a lessee wanted to deploy an offshore wind related buoy, they would follow the same process they follow for non offshore wind related buoys. Um, that, that there wasn't anything magical about offshore wind buoys that kind of justified a higher level of uh, scrutiny by the government. So, um, but again, that's that's that was the proposal. And uh, we've been, we've read all the comments and we're, we're working on the final. Yeah, th thank you for that. I, I assume because we're in that radio silent period that there's there's no um, schedule for when that might show up in the Federal Register. Uh, nothing. Not, I don't think there's anything that we've made public. No. But you might think you might consider things like the Congressional Review Act deadline. Those are things that I think all agencies have their eye on right now. Exactly. Uh, thank, thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Brian, uh, Bridget, and Abigail. I really appreciate your comments. Bef and we are almost back on time. But before we go into our next session, I want to give uh, Eric and David, two committee members who have come on, a chance to introduce themselves real quick. Eric or David, just sort of jump on if you're still, if you're there. Yeah, hi, yeah. this is Eric. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah Eric, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Well, good afternoon where you are at. Um, sorry, my video is not really working on my phone, but um, Eric Kingler, Executive Director of the Hawaii Longline Association. Uh, we're a major fishery in the United States, 150 vessels operating out of Honolulu, and um, major supplier of domestic U.S. produced tuna. Thanks. So, 
Can you hear me? Yes. So this is Dave Wallace. I am a, a representative of the commercial fishery, fishing industry on the East Coast of the United States, particularly Mid-Atlantic and New England. And we are highly interested in uh, the development of offshore wind and how it impacts fisheries and uh, the habitat of the, the within the air the least areas and then the um, cumulative impacts. And so I'm sorry I'm late, but I'm good uh, happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric, Eric and David. All right, so uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Elaine Hoffman, a professor and eminent scholar in the Department of Ocean and Earth Sciences and a member of the Center for Coastal Physical Oceanography, both at Old Dominion University in Norfolk. And Ellen chaired the National Academy's report, Potential Hy Hydrodynamic Impacts of Offshore Wind Energy on Nantucket Shoals Regional Ecology and Evaluation from Wind to Whales. Ellen, we're looking forward to hearing an update on the report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, see, can I share my screen? Not sure that I have that capability yet. So let me try again. Yes. Okay, now I now I see. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Well, first off, um, thank you for your introduction and for the opportunity to provide um, the standing committee with an overview of um, the study that was done to develop uh, the, this consensus report, Potential Hydrodynamic Impacts of Offshore Wind Development on Nantucket Region Ecology and Evaluation from Wind to Whales, and also an opportunity to present key recommendations from the report. Um, so, so I'm gonna start with a little bit of background on the region of interest, and this, this slide um, shows the Nantucket Shoals region, which is located to the southwest of, of Cape Cod over here. And also shown on the slide is the outline of the proposed wind energy lease areas that are planned for installation on this part of the U.S. continental shelf. And we heard from Brian Hooker's presentation that these are active leases that are under, under development. Um, the colors in the, um, on the schematic here represent the different wind energy projects. Um, so the, the committee was given a statement of task that's shown on this particular slide. And the first task was to assess the state of the science on the effects of offshore wind turbine structures at local to regional scales on hydrodynamic processes and the scale of the change related to natural variability. So this first task is uh, addressing this task is based on information available in the literature that is the peer reviewed articles and reports and reports provided in support of developing offshore wind energy. The second task is to use the information from the literature review plus information gained from public information gathering sessions to comment on the ability to estimate the extent of the perturbations from the offshore wind energy structures on the oceanography with emphasis on ecosystem impacts that might affect the availability of prey for North Atlantic right whales. The other way of saying this, can these uh, changes be observed? The committee was then asked to evaluate the models used by BOEM in environmental impact analyses or studies in the wind energy areas in the Nantucket Shoals region. So what that's asking is, can the effects be modeled and simulated? And finally, the committee was asked to suggest approaches for assessing the hydrodynamic impacts of wind turbine generators. Okay, so who took on these tasks? The committee members are shown on this slide. The committee expertise include observations and modeling of hydrodynamic processes, atmospheric dynamics, marine mammal ecology and population dynamics, soil plankton population ecology and dynamics in ecological modeling. And the committee also included expertise from wind farms that have been installed in European waters. Okay, so how did we do this? Um, so BOM provided, the study sponsor provided a one-year contract to the academies 
that started in March of 2023. Um, the, the, the Academy staff then organized the committee you saw on the previous slide, and we started work in April of 2023 by planning our public workshop to do the information gathering. The workshop took place in June, and the committee had other in-person meetings as well as virtual meetings to discuss conclusions, recommendations, and to write the report. The report was sent for external review in early August, and I note that that was three months after, a little, well, a little less than three months after the first workshop we had. The committee then got reviews on the report. We responded to the uh, uh, reviews, and we ended up with a peer-reviewed consensus report that was published in October 2023, which is about six months after um, the doc after we started the whole process. So this was clearly a fast track report and it's to the credit of the committee members and the academy staff that it was able to be done in, in the time that we were allotted. We also produced a, a short highlights document and a one page summary. And subsequent to the publication of the report, the committee members have given several uh, presentations at meetings and conferences about the report. Uh, for example, there was a presentation at the Ocean Sciences meeting in February of this year. And just about a week or so ago, there was a presentation at the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative for Offshore Wind, the Marine Mammal Subcommittee meeting. And we are continuing to make presentations on our report. So I'm gonna start with providing a summary of the conclusions from the report. All right, the first conclusion is that significant natural and anthropogenic variability um, exists in the um, Nantucket Shoals region, and that suggests that perturbations in the hydrodynamics due to wind farm development or the infrastructure from the wind farms are likely to be difficult to isolate, and the effects on zooplankton are likely to be difficult to distinguish. The second conclusion is that significant uncertainties exist in assessing the hydrodynamic impacts associated with wind wake and ocean wake effects at a range of scales, which I'll come to here in a moment, and also uh, on the abundance and aggregation of zooplankton prey like Calanus finmarchicus, which is a prey for the North Atlantic right whale, and current and future foraging patterns of the North Atlantic right whale. So the report structure looks like this. Um, so now I'm going to look at the <clears throat> look at the report and the information in the report that supports the conclusions and recommendations from the study. So the report structure is shown here. There are four chapters. I've already talked a little bit about what's in the introduction to the report. Um, chapter three of the report considers the oceanography and the ecology of the Nantucket Shoals region which we refer to as the ocean oceanographic regime. Chapter three deals with the hydrodynamic impacts of offshore wind energy development. And chapter four deals with the uh, ecological impacts. So I'm gonna start with describing the oceanographic regime because that's very important for the conclusions the committee came to. All right, so this is a summary schematic that was used in the report showing the um, physical oceanography of the hydrodynamics of the Nantucket Shoals region. And in this area, we have um, the hydrodynamics are driven by complex interactions among processes at the shelf break, seasonal stratification, interannual variability, bottom frictions, tides, and flows over complex bathymetry. The complex oceanography is additionally influenced by region-specific processes such as long-term surface densification, onshore um, midwater intrusions of slope water, Gulf Stream warm core rings, and onshore displacement of the shelf break front, and inter interdecadal variability in the circulation. All right, so a clear result from the literature and from the workshop we had is that major oceanographic changes have been occurring this region occurring in this region since about 2000. And these changes include warming of surface and bottom temperature, water temperatures, increased frequency of Gulf Stream warm core rings and midwater intrusions into the tidally mixed inshore regions. 
All right, the warming water temperature affects the onset, uh, decay, and intensity of the seasonal stratification. And these changes affect the ocean, all affect the oceanography of the region, but the long-term trends and consequences remain to be determined, mainly because the system is continually evolving. So we've got, you know, it's a moving target. And as shown in the bottom of the schematic, the changes in the oceanography can produce ecosystem responses. So the report also summarizes information about the biological oceanography of the Nantucket Shoals region. And the focus in here is the North Atlantic uh, right whale, which is shown on this slide, and interactions with its prey are, are, the, are the focus for this. All right, and this is because the Nantucket Shoals region is an important foraging area for North Atlantic right whales during the winter and spring when they migrate to the area to, to, to forage. All right, so North Atlantic right whales feed on small energy rich zooplankton and in particular copepods such as Calanus finmarchicus. All right, and the life cycle of Calanus finmarchicus is shown in the, in the lower right hand side of, the, of this slide. And the older copepidid stages, the C5 stage and the adults um, are the target prey for the right whales, all right? And successful foraging by the right whale depends on the copepod prey being found in sufficient densities and at appropriate depths. And so this makes the right whale sensitive to disturbances of their prey in the water column. So chapter three of the report provides an assessment of hydrodynamic impacts that is based upon observational and modeling studies. All right, so how is this assessment done? Well, the committee framed its assessment around three scales that are shown on this slide that represent effects at the wind turbine scale, the wind farm scale, and the regional scale. And the spatial range included for each of these scales is shown across the bottom underneath um, each of the figures here. All right, so what type of effects on the hydrodynamics do we consider? Well, this is illustrated using um, the schematic that's shown here. Um, and this is from the um, wind turbine scale. So we first looked at atmospheric effects because as the wind blows across um, the turbine or wind farm, Energy is extracted from the wind and produces a wind wake of pot potentially diminished um, strength downstream of the wind turbine, all right? And this effect occurs at the turbine, but also at the wind farm scale. Um, the, um, the, the, in the ocean, um, the turbine structure causes an ocean wake that means that the water becomes more turbulent downstream behind the turbine, and that's shown here by the increased number of squirrels downstream of, of the uh, turbine. And this effect carries over to the wind farm scale as, as well. So what we came realize is that significant uncertainties exist in understanding these effects. Our knowledge is limited and primarily based on a few observations and modeling studies done for wind farms in the North Sea. And the, it's important to note that the North Sea modeling studies at the wind farm scale have yet to be validated with observations. So the structure and the magnitude of the wind wake at the sea surface is poorly understood. Most of the observational and modeling studies have focused on changes in the wind at the hub height, which is up here at, uh, at the top of the turbine and not at the sea surface and the effect of ocean surface roughness on wind stress reductions at the sea surface is, is also poorly understood. So what is the state of being able to estimate the perturbations from wind turbines and wind farms on the hydrodynamic regime? Well, at the turbine scale, there are very few observations that we can do for verification of the wake behavior, either in the ocean or in, in the atmosphere. The potential effects of the wind farm scale shown on this slide are mostly from limited modeling studies that have not been grounded in observations. And the hydrodynamic effects at the regional scale are difficult to quantify because of the natural variability. All right, so the committee considered the hydrodynamic models that are available for assessing the effects at the three scales for the Nantucket Shoals region. 
And this is a table from the report that summarizes the results in terms of model capability that's needed to assess the effects at different scales. I idealized models, which is the third column here, um, can be applied all across all of these scales, but mostly to assess key processes. The large eddy simulation and the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes types of models can support predictions, but they do it at different scales. All right, and this, this was an important part of the report is the ability to predict these effects. So uh, the conclusion from this assessment is that a range of models that resolve appropriate scales are needed to address questions about the effects of wind turbines and wind farms on hydrodynamic processes. So this led to the first recommendation that had to do with hydrodynamic observations as shown here. Um, and this first recommendation um, says that observational studies that target processes at, at relevant turbine to wind scales are needed to isolate quantify and characterize hydrodynamic effects. And um, the committee recommends that Balm, NOAA, and others should promote and require where possible these observational studies and that the existing wind farms provide opportunities to do case studies. The second recommendation deals with hydrodynamic modeling and it's shown on this slide. And that is again, BOM and NOAA and others should require model validation studies to determine the capability and appropriateness of a particular model to simulate key baseline hydrodynamic processes that are relevant at turbine, wind farm, and regional scales. In addition, these studies should evaluate the ability of the model to represent the physical complexity. And that physical complexity was represented in the oceanographic schematic I showed earlier. Um, it should also be able to evaluate, the um, study should also evaluate model sensitivity. Strongly uh, came out in the report was the need to quantify uncertainty and also to evaluate the model performance. The last um, bullet here recommends making the model parameterizations and configurations and solutions publicly available. All right, this comes from experiences in the ocean and the climate communities that show more progress is made more rapidly when a diverse community is engaged or involved in model development, implementation, and analysis. So now we turn to the ecological impacts all right, and this, again, we had a schematic that provides a summary of, of the ecological effects. All right, and what's shown here is phytoplankton productivity, which is primarily controlled by, controlled by water column stratification and seasonal uh, sun insulation. Zooplankton forage on, this, on, on the phytoplankton produced in seasonal blooms. And the most of the higher trophic level species associated with the Nantucket Shoals region feed either directly or indirectly on zooplankton that are found in the region. All right, so as always, uh, as previously mentioned, high concentrations of zooplankton, including Calamus pinmarchicus, uh, is the primary prey of the whales, and it may account for the great numbers of right whales observed in the Nantucket Shoals region and other areas of high productivity on the southern, in southern New England, for example, Cape Cod Bay. I, I should mention that Calanus finmarchicus is more likely infected into the area rather than being locally produced, which places emphasis on the circulation. Also, right whales are probably eating other small zooplankton as well in the area, and chapter two of the report provides a figure showing what these other zooplankton prey may be. All right, so the concern here is the potential of wind turbines and wind farms to disrupt the abundance and the aggregation of zooplankton, which could in turn disrupt right whale foraging patterns. And this figure from the report illustrates the connectivity between hydrodynamics and calanus. And the important message from this is that calanus is affected by hydrodynamic processes at a range of scales. All right, so as mentioned in the previous slide, part of the previous slide, Calanus supply is dependent on transport processes rather than local production. 
So the implication is that perturbations to the hydrodynamics by wind turbines and wind farms can potentially disrupt zooplankton availability to right whales. So what about the impacts on the right whale? So a summary of the ability to assess these impacts is provided on this slide. Right, hydrodynamic impacts on zooplankton are difficult to assess as shown by the previous slide. Um, we lack understanding of foraging by right whales in the Nantucket Shoals region. All right, so because studies at a wind farm scale do not adequately capture the right whale's broad use of the Nantucket Shoals foraging region because the right whale foraging, foraging decisions um, uh, depend on the availability or not of the prey resources in distant habitats. All right, so, um, so, so this makes it difficult to detect and or predict potential impacts on, on right whales. So the recommendation, the third recommendation um, it, for oceanographic and ecological observations is shown on this slide. And again, BOM, NOAA, and others should require the collection of oceanographic and ecological observations through a robust integrated monitoring program before, during, and all phases of wind energy development, including the surveying, construction, operation, and decommissioning. And this is particularly important as the right whale use of the Nantucket Shoals region continues to evolve due to oceanographic changes and or the activities and conditions relevant to offshore wind turbines. The related oceanographic and modeling recommendation is shown here. And that is that BOEM, NOAA and others should require oceanographic and ecological modeling before and during all phases of energy, wind energy development, surveying, construction, operation, and decommissioning. And um, this critical information will help guide regional policies that will protect right whales and improve predictions of ecological impacts from wind development at other lease sites. Okay, so the key takeaway messages from the report are summarized on this slide. The first deals with the uncertainties associated with identifying and, and assessing the impacts of wind turbines and wind farms on the hydrodynamics, abundance and aggregation of zooplankton, and current and future foraging patterns of right whales. And there are significant uncertainties associated with all three of those things. The second message relates to the scale of perturbations from wind turbines and wind farms relative to the scale of natural and anthropogenic variability. The perturbations from the wind turbines and wind farms may be difficult to isolate from the natural and anthropogenic signals. And that would make the um, effects on the zooplankton difficult to distinguish. The last takeaway message here is development of offshore wind should include coordinated regional programs to understand and identify hydrodynamic and ecological effects at turbine and wind farm scales and modeling studies that capture the physical and biological complexity of the region. So I'll stop here at this point, but we have acknowledgements. We thank um, BOM for supporting this study. We also thank the many volunteers who very generously gave their time and expertise to, to helping us with the study. Um, the people listed here were very generous with ideas, inputs, data, and that was very critical for the study. We also thank the people who reviewed the report and the report review, review committee for their insightful and very helpful comments. So I'll stop at that point and say thank you, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you may have. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Could you do me a favor? I'm gonna, could you go back to the takeaway slide or whoever is controlling that? Yes. There we go. So. I'm curious to hear what would be a priority on this slide for you? Like, what are the things that we need to know sooner rather than later? 
Well, that's a hard one because the three things listed at the top right here are the three priorities. All right, but I think if we understood the hydrodynamic impacts, that would go a long way to helping understand impacts on zooplankton and right whale foraging. So I don't know that I would do it one, two, three, they're, they're combined but I think starting with the hydrodynamics would be the place to begin. Great, thank you. There's a question that opened, it came up in the chat that I could bring into the conversation, but I wanna see if there's any committee members that have any questions or comments. Ron? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Great presentation. I'm curious, though, it seems to emphasize what's needed is a lot of modeling. But it's really not talking much about ecological sampling, sampling programs to provide the information, not only <clears throat> to fill out the models and update the models, because as we know, we have extreme climate change occurring in this area, but actual data actually uh i'm concerned for example with settlement of uh the zooplankton primarily shellfish like scallops it seems to me the best way to get a handle on that is actually go out there and and do continuous uh plankton surveys and uh, optical surveys for looking for settlement as opposed to trying to model it i mean was there Somewhere in the report, some details about uh, modeling cumulative effects across the range of wind farms. I mean, right now, each wind farm develops their own sampling and monitoring program. There's no consistency. There's no standardization. Is, is this been uh, discussed? Um, to, to try to address the first part of your question, um, Recommendation number three does call for coordinated ecological observations. Coordinated with, with equivalent oceanographic or environmental observations. Now that is in the report. The, the importance to do that. How this gets implemented, I think is what you're asking in terms of coordination, measurements, observations within and I need mean, hold on one second. I'm sorry. Ron, can you go on to mute? There's some background noise which is making it very hard to hear. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Now, should I start again? Um, okay. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. So so we have our recommendation here for uh, oceanographic and ecological observations. And we ask or we recommend the importance of integrated monitoring and observational programs uh, within and around the, the turbine structures and the wind farms. Your, I think the second part of your question deals with implementing those measurements and those monitoring programs. I, we did not deal with that in this report. However, there is a second workshop or uh, report kind of thing that will be done this summer that is specifically looking at what is needed to implement this recommendation, if you will, for monitoring and observing the impacts of, um, of the uh, wind farms and the wind turbines on things like zooplankton distributions. And that in the workshop that will occur this summer, will look at what you just mentioned. How do you do it? How, what nets do you use? How frequent do you sample? How do you look at cumulative effects? So it's sort of a, the, the, you know, you could look at this report as setting up the implementation that will, is now on, on, under development. Okay, thank you. And is that a bone-driven process, this cumulative impacts? Yes, yeah, so, so the workshop that's going to take place later this year is, is sponsored by BOM. And the kinds of que the question that you just asked are specific, or what the workshop is um, being designed to specifically answer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve. 
Yes, thank you for that uh, very informative presentation. Uh, Ron pretty much asked my question, but uh, the, the the first part, the second part is um, what what recommendations uh, would you make for doing a comparable study on the West Coast where upwelling is so important to our our uh, ecosystem? And um, and then as part of that, the 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 next workshop would that just be focused on uh, New England, or would that uh, also include our area here on the West Coast? Um. Okay, so to answer your first question, I think that the um, recommendations from this report are broad enough and general enough that they could apply to the to the West Coast. I mean, we're calling for integrated modeling studies, integrated observational studies that cover the whole range of processes of physics and biology. There is upwelling on the Mid-Atlantic Shelf, so you would so that would just be part of what would be maybe the more important process on the Pacific coast. So I think the recommendations can in fact inform how things get done on other areas. All right, for the um, second part of your question, the workshop I, as it stands now will be focused on the, on the Nantucket Shoals Northeast um, um, shelf area on the East Coast of the United States. Um, I don't know if there are plans for the Pacific Coast, but that, that might be something to ask. Yeah. Great. I don't see any uh, more questions by the committee members. It is time for a break, and I do see that both in the question Q&A and the chat, there are some questions. We do have time at the end of the day. Uh, and maybe we can return to some of them because I think they're also a little bit more policy focused about how do we manage risks uh, rather than uh, particular comments about the study itself. Caroline, does that all sound good? Uh, yep, yeah, that sounds great to me. And also, um, I'm checking with our academy staff that are working on the hydrodynamics workshop to see if there's any other information I can share if that has a website yet. Um, but if not, we'll we'll share that information with everyone um, as it comes out. I'm not sure how far along the um, things like websites are at this point. But yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking too. <laughs> okay, we'll take, um, I'm gonna take 10 minute break and come, we'll be back here at, um, it's 3.20 on the East Coast time, so 3.40 um, or your respective time. Thanks everyone, enjoy the, the uh, eclipse if you're on the East Coast. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll come back from break here um, and move on to our last presentation. Um, for uh, last presentation today is on the Boehm Bessie split rule, and we have Wright Frank um, from Boehm's policy office who will. Um, Hi there. Um, is, can I share my screen now, or this... just a second? If anyone has trouble with what I'm sharing, I'm putting a link in the chat. Um, this is the document I'm looking at. I, I'm. I don't have a presentation planned. I was going to uh, just read from the notice lessees that we published at about the time it was the split rule was published. Um, are you able to share your screen yet? Oh, uh, I hadn't tried yet. Okay. Just let me give it a shot. Okay. What is that? Is it working? Uh, that looks. Good. Yep. That's the, the same thing you put in the link. Yes. It's the same thing I put in the link. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, so I, uh, we, I'll go through the, a little bit of background on the, on the split. Um, and then uh, if I'm not focusing on what you're interested in, um, we can kind of have an opportunity to redirect or, or, or ask some questions. Um, 
But just a little bit of uh, brief history on, because we're talking about the kind of the structures, the way these the, the bureaus are structured. Um, going, going back to the beginning, uh, the Department of the Interior got authority over uh, offshore yep. renewable energy in uh, EPACT, the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Uh, at that time, the secretary delegated um, the authority to the Marine Minerals Service, which is our predecessor. We'll, we'll, we're just kind of following um, the, the progression of this. Following Deepwater Horizon in 2010, um, uh, the Marine Minerals Service, the MMS, was reorganized into the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Resource and Research. Uh, oh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Resource. Of, um, geez, I, I blanked out. I lived through it. I was at I was at Bomer. Um, are an enforcement and, and regulatory enforcement. I'll somebody Google that and I'll I'll figure I'll figure it out. But um, we had instructions at that point to form two bureaus. Uh, which, uh, again, the next level of, we were only Bomer for a short while, and then we became the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, which is what we are today. So, but that was not for renewable energy. That was for oil and gas, because um, that was really you know, the focus of, of everybody's attention at that time. Um, the, the decision at that point was that it didn't make sense to transfer authority to Bessie over uh, kind of inspection and, and um, structures, because there weren't any structures at, at that time. There's literally one meteorological tower in Nantucket Shoals um, operated by Cape Wind, and that was the only structure out there. So um, the, the instructions were to kind of wait until there was an, enough activity to justify transferring the uh, authority to, to Bessie, uh, which is the Bureau of Safety and Environment Enforcement. Um, in September of 20, 2022, uh, there was a decision that now there was enough. Okay, so that was, that was enough to justify uh, transferring the authority. The transfer of authority on paper actually happened in September of 2022, but the regulations were still all on the bone side. So we needed a rule change to kind of sort the regulations into the bone and Bessie sides. Um, and that's and that happened in January 2023. Um, and that's the that's the rule that I that um kind of it, it was a direct final it was a final rule. So it, it was not published in proposed form because it was entirely administrative. It didn't change any responsibilities, it just changed who was responsible for. Um, and we we our, our lawyers kept us very on task on that. We did not, uh, we were very careful to make sure we're not changing any um, any authorities, not changing any, anything substantive, just administratively uh, drawing the line between the two. But um, this, this document that I've linked to and that I have open here is uh, a good, I mean, it's uh, a, a good, uh, it's guidance that was uh, explaining the division of labor between the two uh, bureaus. So there's there's a little bit of history, there's, um, a little bit of what I just kind of went through very briefly, and then there's kind of the summary part, which focuses on uh, you know what authorities are tra are transferred to Bessie and which ones are retained by them. Um, so. Uh, Evaluating and overseeing facility design, fabrication, installation, safety management systems, and oil spill response plans is Bessie. Uh, enforcing operational safety, again, through inspections, incident reporting, investigations, that's Bessie. Uh, enforcing compliance, uh, in, in, including safety and environmental compliance with all applicable laws, regulations, leases, grants, and approved plans through notices of non-compliance cessation orders, civil penalties, and other appropriate means, SPESI, and overseeing the decommissioning activities in SPESI. Everything else, for the most part, is, you know, remains with BOEM. So uh, BOEM is, uh, is the primary agency for identifying uh, new areas on the Outer Continental Shelf that may be appropriate for leasing, uh, holding auctions to allocate uh, um, 
allocate those areas uh, uh, as, as leases, um, so auctions. Um, and then environmental reviews are also in Bowen. Um, uh, establishing the correct amount of financial assurance um, and collecting the financial assurance is Bowen's responsibility. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the major outlines. The, the rest of this document, 20 pages or so, um, if you want more details, it goes into more details. It goes into suspensions. So if a suspension, if it's ordered by the agency, is Bessie. So you can imagine if they find something, uh, some uh, resource that's that's at risk and they uh, need to the, the, the operator to suspend activities and they direct a suspension, that is Bessie. If, uh, a suspension is requested by the less by the lessee. For example, for reasons outside of their control, if they need to uh, stop uh, stop work, uh, they can request a suspension, and that kind of tolls the lease term and their lease. That is that is us. So that's what kind of some of this goes into. Notices of noncompliance or nonks um, or Bessie civil penalties. Um, there is some enforcement responsibility retained by uh, by Boehm over. So we we regulate our our regulations, and um, if someone violates Boehm's regulations, Boehm can enforce those. But uh, the the vast majority of that moves over to Bessie. Um, you can also think of it like in a in the development timeline of the projects, uh, there being kind of a transfer from Boehm to Bessie. So. You know, we develop the air, we, we identify the area, we pay the lease sale, we receive the construction operations plan, we do the environmental um, environmental uh, reviews under NEPA and consultations. Um, and then if we approve the project, the next step is for the lessee to submit you know, more detailed engineering level reports. So. The, uh, the FDR and the FIR, the fabrication installation report and the, uh, the facility design report. Um, that's where the transfer happens. So though Bessie gets those, um, and you know, again, we are supporting Bessie because you know, no one can staff a, an agency overnight, but they they've been hiring. They're they're getting their uh, capabilities in place. We've been supporting them. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to do so. So, and, and they cooperate in our processes too, because uh, the enforcer uh, has an appropriate place at the table in determining what the, um, say, for example, the terms and conditions on the approval of the construction and operations plan. If they're going to be enforcing it, um, you know, they they may have something to say about about what, it's, what the requirements are. Like. So, that is uh, that that's the. You know the, what I wanted to tell you guys about about this split. Um, so now there's two major offshore renewable energy agencies. Um, I do I don't have anyone here to represent Bessie's side of all this, but I can I work with them every day and would be happy to you know put people in touch if, if they have questions that are better directed to them. Yeah, thanks for that um, overview. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how these two entities work together, since this is a relatively new split. There's not a lot of history for, you know, how these two will work together. What have you talked about and sort of What's the vision for how Bohm and Bessie will continue to have engagement after lease sales? Uh, so one thing we did at the um, split, like when we were having the split, we got together and you know kind of made big lists of, of everything and just said, well, um, who's primarily responsible for it and uh, is there like a notice requirement or a cooperation requirement? And that, that's a doc document that we have that we've established with them. I'm not sure if it's public or not, but it really kind of 
it's kind of for us to work out with Betsy what our relationship is. Um, right now, there haven't been, there aren't standard operating procedures kind of all in place yet, but that is definitely work that we're, we've already started. Like we were starting to put together standard operating procedures to kind of determine how that relationship goes. Um, so far, it you know, every everybody, we all kind of know each other very well since the program was just with Boehm for, for a long time. And for now, our relationships are very strong and we you know, call each other up in you know, regular standing meetings with Bessie. Um, and I, I see that as being kind of the bridge that we use until we have the standard operating procedures written down. But there will, that's that's the vision is to have something. So if they're writing a notice of noncompliance, they know who in, in Bowen they need to notify uh, because you know we have ongoing relationships with the lessees as well. When we are, um, and, and likewise, when, when we're putting together a new lease sale or we're being, you know, developing terms and conditions of a of a plan approval, um, that's that's something that they need to be involved in too, and we're, we're involved in. So can I um, maybe just ask a, a follow up question? So there's now, you know, kind of differences in responsibilities, and I, I appreciate and I'm really grateful that there's good kind of rapport among the, you know, the folks in both organizations. But I'm concerned that without kind of a standing set of meetings, joint timelines, and effectively joint mission between Bohm and Bessie, that eventually these two will diverge with less communication, kind of ongoing communication and more a handoff from one to the other. And I, and I see that in order to really do this successfully, there needs to be continued engagement, kind of shared goals, shared mission. Have you guys talked about that? Or, you know, as you're putting together these standard operating, operating procedures, kind of what's the, what's been the discussion in the room about how together you envision moving forward toward what I hope is kind of a, a common common end and goal. Um, so yes, the messaging on this and from from the start has been like hand in glove, like lockstep. The, you know, this that's that is definitely the the goal that we're striving toward. I I also appreciate your you know recognition that when you have two different organizations that, that that's you know that can become a, that can be challenging right and that's mm -hmm. that is why we need um procedures that kind of that have all this we also we do have standing regular meetings I, i'm on several regular meetings with Bessie. um and i i do i think i think rather than having some kind of pat answer that kind of sets it it needs to be kind of a continued Area that we're always working on, um, mm -hmm. and, and this—it's not just true for Bessie; it's for other agencies too. We, we are always working on our relationships with other agencies. Um, so I, I, I definitely appreciate and share your, your concern that that we continue to to work well together and to work toward the same goals. Um, I think part of the reason for splitting the bureaus was. Uh, was a concern that our maybe our missions were too aligned and that it was appropriate to have a, um, a more enforcement focused agency and a more you know, and have that kind of disentangled from um, from the agency that offers access uh, to the partnership. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I I I do. I share your concern, and I am also. But I, but I, if I, if I wasn't worrying about that, I wouldn't be doing the job. I, we, we should. No one should ever be like, okay, we got that solved. We can stop thinking about it. I think it's an ongoing responsibility for both agencies. Okay, thanks, Wright. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell who raised their hands first. If someone else is, sure, <laughs> we could calm. move to Ron, right? Thank you. Thank you, Ron. 
I'm trying to understand. I, I <clears throat> key authorities retained by Boehm and key authorities transferred. And it says enforcing Boehm regulations. And then uh, down below it says uh, enforcing compliance, including uh, environmental compliance. What I'm trying to find out is what is the regulation. So for example, in the COP, they say they're going to bury the cables two meters. How do you check that? Is that, is that a regulation? Or is it just, oh, that's a good idea, bury it two meters. Um, and, the, you, know, you know, they talk about the level of acoustic uh, outputs of seismic, you know, bottom profilers. What if they exceed that, which we know probably has impacts on, you know, marine organisms. There's no, where's the regulations? What regulations are they following? Uh, thanks. That's a, that's a good question. There are, so there are the regulations, which are, you know, that's what's in the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR, that's, um, and that, and this was a, a change in the regulations that kind of distributed them uh, among the agencies. Then there's the Construction Operations Plan, which is developed by the lessee, and it's, if, if we approve it, 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 it the lessee is, is bound to follow that, and whatever conditions we put on our approval of that plan. Um, I you, you're I think you're right to point to the the two meters the barrel barrel requirements that would be covered in the construction operations plan. Um, so it wouldn't be a regulation, but it's still enforceable. They're bound by that, um, and that would be, uh, I, I believe, Bessie is enforcing that kind of thing. So that's that is in their authority on the. Um, on the sound levels of sound, um, there's people who know more about this than me and some of my phone here. Um, but I do, I think for the most part they're set up so that um, you measure the sound um, and as you go and if, if, if it's if it's over th certain thresholds, then there's steps for them to kind of stop and and work on it um, to, to ensure that they don't too high but um and, and some of that involves Boehm because we have a center for marine acoustics that has expertise in sound population um brian might be able to go I don't, I don't know if you're interested in the specifics or like who's who's responsible for the um like we like we could go down the rabbit hole and sound field verification very quickly but um it's uh Ultimately, um, this right here, which says that enforcing Boehm regulations, um, most of that, you know, if uh, most of that is not of the, you know, related to actual activities on the lease that are happening in the lease area. Almost, I, I'm pretty sure that all of that, all of that is in Bessie's uh, sphere. I, I guess. <clears throat> my experience let's just take fisheries management okay there's a uh, you're only allowed to land a thousand pounds you come to the dock there is either a national marine fisheries service agent there or a uh, a contracted state enforcement agent that has an agreement with the national marine fisheries service at sea the national marine fisheries service doesn't have enforcement vessels they contract, they have an agreement with the Coast Guard. I just don't see, <clears throat> does Bessie have any boats? You know, do they have any enforcement agents that are out there? Is somebody uh, checking the depth of the cables? Is somebody checking the noise levels behind an acoustic uh, survey vessel? Is there any active enforcement, let alone defining whether there's a regulation? I don't even know. You know, they propose that they're going to use 240 decibels, but I don't know if it's a violation if they use 300. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, that is, we are not just leaving it up to the lessee and hoping for the best. We, this is checked. Um, I believe the primary check of this is the uh, certified verification agent, um, which uh, is the neutral 
third party with a lot of expertise on uh, on these issues, and they submit reports to us. And if and they and uh, there's also a lot of reporting requirements that come to both Boeing and Bessie and other resource agencies. Um, and yeah, it's it's not it's not a yeah that's there are there are checks in this. Um, it's not as it's probably a little more complicated than having someone waiting at the dock. Um, but uh, great, Steve. Thanks. Um, I, I always seem to follow right along with Ron. So uh, doing that, um, I've been I've been dealing with Bohm for I don't know two and a half three years or so. And <clears throat> last year when we had our first in person meeting of this uh, uh, this uh, committee, uh, somebody mentioned Bessie, and there were a number of us in the room who never heard of Bessie. Who asked, "Who is this Bessie?" So um, we were surprised to find out that there is a, a sister agency that will then have all, all of this handed off to them at some point. So um, Ron's uh, question about enforcement at the dock, um, being a fishery manager uh, involved with uh, federal fisheries uh, management, um, you know, with National Marine Fishery Service, we have one-stop shopping. They're they're involved in the development of the fishing regulations, well, in the assessments, in the the uh, development of the catch limits, the regulations, and then in the enforcement. And uh, as a tribal fishery manager, I I work with them throughout the process. So um, I I see that with this offshore wind development that uh, that that's really a, a weak link in that uh, there are a lot of uh, unanswered questions and un un unknowns about what's what's going to happen, what the impacts will be, and a uh, great many concern of the tribes about how this will impact their culture, their resources, and their, their actual existence. So um, not having Bessie uh, in the room when we're, we're dealing with this pre- Pre uh, uh, lease and pre construction phase, I I think is a, a failure, and for uh, this just to be handed off to Bessie once uh, you get to that point, I I don't see how Bessie could really understand at that point what what the issues are uh, that the the fishing industry and others concerned about the resources. What 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 the issues will be there? So, isn't there a way for Bessie to be engaged throughout this, being at the table with Boehm? And uh, it seems like that that save a lot of trouble down the road. Um, yeah, thank you for that. The the, uh, the the idea is for Bessie to be involved early in the process. Um, I don't. Maybe they're not out in front of people as much as as we are. We, we spend a, a lot of resources on public engagement, and I'm not sure they're. I don't. I'm not going to speak for them. Um, but we are also involved in their side of the process, and we we maintain a foot in each other's camps and, and as far as involvement and and the, the, I I um, we we can. I don't, we can have them, uh, we, can, we can bring them in and, and ask them. I, I don't want to speak for them exactly because they're not, I'm not with them, but um, yeah, that's, I appreciate your concern with that. Brian? Thank you. I, I um... Yeah, I, th I raised my hand just to, to talk about, you know, my experience in, in um, you know, working with Betsy. Uh, and, and again, I think when we first, you know, invited a policy office, we were just trying to get a flavor of what you're interested in. I mean, certainly we can, you know, if you want to invite Betsy to a future meeting, that's something that we can certainly consider. 
But I want I want to address from like the environmental side, you know, what are how the relationship you know works. I don't know if that this will help at all. But uh, Bessie is a co-action agency and a cooperating agency on all of our documents. So that means they they are they're they're reviewing the terms and conditions of of, of COP approval. They're in the EIS to see uh, you know are, are the conditions written in a way that they understand are, and are enforceable. That that won't change. They they weren't. They're not all of a sudden going to be not become a cooperating agency or not be a co-action agency on the um, on the you know uh, the different consultations, whether it's EFH or ESA or 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 any or anything else for that matter. Um, so they're they are there. Um, but as Wright said, you know they're um, we're the we're the lead federal agency, so you probably see us more than you see them. Um, and then, not to overly complicate things, but uh, you know, Ron, you're asking about uh, you know the regulations. Well, for a lot of these, we have uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service implementing regulations for um, uh, for takes of of marine mammals, and so they, so the Office of NOAA Office of Law Enforcement does have a role in enforcing regulations uh, under that uh, the MMPA rule uh, that they have. So the, you, there's more than <laughs> there's there's the D Department of Interior side um, that is one one Department of Interior family with the regulations under um, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, but there are other uh, statutes at play for different aspects of this too. So you may see, you know, different agencies outside of the Department of the Interior playing an enforcement role depending on what aspect of the project um, is is being looked at. So anyway, I just wanted to really kind of put that context in there that um, you know I don't necessarily see uh you know we we work hand, have to work hand in hand with um all these agencies uh you know from that the, the development of the of the measures for the plan and then the um oversight and implementation of the uh of the measures that was all i was gonna say great <laughs> thank, thank you. you dan yeah, and and Brian, thank you for adding that that context because I I was gonna I was gonna ask uh, mainly for the benefit of of Ron and and Steve, just if you could speak or write if you could speak a little bit about the tools that Bessie uh, has, which is the notice to lessees, and how the NTLs, as they're often referred to, have been um, you know a very useful tool for managing some of the other energy energy industries such as oil and gas because uh, I, I think that might be applicable you know we're the, the threat of curtailment or of shutting down the operation is how the NTLs can have a hammer if you will um, and and Ron uh, and or Steve it's 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 not necessarily managing over extraction of, uh, of a fisheries population it's it's really managing the practice of the development once it's um, commissioned and and generating power. So I, I you know may, maybe just a little a little conversation about the NTL and and how that's used from the folks who actually apply it uh, could be helpful here. Thank you. Yeah. So notices to lessees are. Um, well, historically, they're oil and gas. They're the oil and gas program's name for guidance documents. They're external facing. So, um, we are. We also have guidance. We have guidance that says that governs uh, um, uh, like how close together your line spacing has to be in your, in your surveys. Um, that is how we you know, communicate our expectations for how certain. How things will be done. So, for you were talking about how close together uh, survey lines have to be, it's it's about getting full coverage of the lease area, and this is our understanding using you know. To, uh, and and if if you know the, the regulations will say something like you need to uh, submit adequate um, survey data to characterize you know, the area. The the NTL will. Uh, is our way of saying like here's here's what we think that is, um, and there's usually a way for them to show that they can still meet it without without making meeting those technical guidelines because there's yeah so um, 
I mean, we've traditionally just called that guidance. I think we're moving in the direction of calling those NTLs as well, just to avoid confusion um, and have just you know, one name for things. Um, but that, yeah, they, the oil and gas program has you know pages and pages of NTLs, um, all sorts of things. It, it may have a fair number of guidance documents as well. Um, Is, is that a little, is that what you were? Just, just how, uh, yes, exactly. Um, you know, it was an explanation of the document and, and, you know, in my industry experience, uh, the developers are motivated to make sure that they follow the NTLs, you know, fairly closely. So, so it does have a, 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 I don't want to use the word regulatory, but it is it it does have a very influential um, result in how the industry behaves um, it, as as oil and gas has developed over the decades. And and my expectation is that that might be a similar process that we see for offshore wind to follow suit. Uh, Bessie has. Uh has you know the tools necessary to make sure it's you know they, they can shut down a project they can i mean there's a, there's a process set out so they, they, but you know ultimately um they, they if, if the lessee is not following the rules we have civil penalty authority we have um, as now i'm saying we in kind of the collective Bessie and Boehm have um uh, um, we can order, we can, well, Bessie can order a suspension. They can just say the project can't operate until, until they can make into compliance. So, um, I, I would, I would think it would have to be severe. It would have to be a, you know, a big enough violation to promote that kind of process. But they, they absolutely have, they have the tools to be noticed. And and someone from Bessie actually just put a good uh, explanation of the other enforcement tools uh, in the chat. So thank you for that. Oh, excellent. Yeah, you know we have Bessie here. Thank you. So we've sort of moved into our discussion section, and I just want to want to remind people that we're back here again tomorrow at one o'clock for the second part of our meeting. And before I open it up for you know focus in on sort of future meeting topics. I do want to come back to some questions that were in the chat earlier and ask uh, Brian or Wright what your sort of thoughts are. And I think I'm going to try to summarize a number of the different comments into sort of what I think people are asking. A lot of times you guys have shown sort of very linear timelines for particular projects or areas. And it doesn't seem like there's a mechanisms for feedback into this process, or at least it's not very explicit. Like you talk about the split rule, it's all very static language. There's no real idea about how are we gonna learn from the ones that are in the water already and how is that gonna feed back into the new iterations and designs or whether or not we open up lease areas or not. And you know that gets at you know this idea of managing risks, right? We don't know everything, we're putting these things in the water and so how are we going to sort of adapt and update as we go that's going to inform your process? Uh, James, do you want me to talk sure. about that? Yeah. Sure, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, again, as I, as I mentioned, I think that that cooperating agency role and co-action agency role in all of, the, all of our, uh, you know, assessments and consultations, I think is really where we will continue to see that feedback loop. And if you look at um, the, the uh, terms and conditions that we have of uh, approving of a COP, it's it's not like BOEM doesn't receive those reports. Um, and, and almost every case, uh, BOEM is also a recipient of, of the reports because we, we know that it's something that we want to look at and evaluate as we're beginning to an environmental review of, of the next project or Doing leasing considerations of of of, an, of a future project, so I, I think we have both 
the, the feedback loop built in from us still receiving the documents, even though we may not be the ones issuing a, a compliance um, um, a citation, um, but we're, we're still rece receiving those, looking at those results. And we also have Bessie saying, hey, we're having a tough time enforcing you know this what what did you mean Boehm, by you know what was your what was your objective in in this and feeding back to us their experience in enforcing that term and condition of cop approval or or whatever it is that 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 they're enforcing so i, I don't think it's going to be like a, a black box where it's just a handoff and and the uh, communication stops because i i know i know from experience they will they will tell us pretty quickly uh and hannah uh, well, I, I think would agree um, that uh, if, if there's something that's not white, not working, or there's they're seeing something in uh, on the ground that needs to be addressed differently, and uh, through the environmental review process. Great. So, uh, committee members, we've got about another fifteen minutes scheduled for us to sort of sort of brainstorm. Uh, future meeting topics and, you know, Brian, right, or I think Abigail's still on. If you guys also have ideas that you want to propose now, we also do have time, right, Carolyn, tomorrow at the end of the day to continue this conversation? Yes, there. Yep, yeah, there's more time um, tomorrow after both of the panel discussions and at the end, end to continue talking about future meeting topic ideas. I don't see any hands being raised, Caroline. So maybe we are done then for today. Do you want to do a sort of quick wrap up? Um, yes, we can shift to that. Um, so thank you all for um, pre presenting today. Um, really interesting to hear the updates from um, Brian, Abby, and um, Bridget, and also um, Right. Thank you for the presentation on the Bo and Bessie split rule. And um, Eileen, I think you're still online. Thank you for the uh, presentation on the report um, that your committee put out last October. This has been a very informative meeting. It's been uh, about a year since this committee last met, and I'm glad to see that we had a lot of participant participation from the public. If we didn't get to all of your questions online, either answering them in person or um typing up a response. It's something that uh, staff here at the National Academies will work to try to get you all an answer um, in the coming week after this the meeting concludes. Um, as Jim mentioned, we will start tomorrow at one o'clock. We have two uh, panel discussions that we will hear from tomorrow and uh, plenty of time for question and answer and discussion and thinking about how this committee can have think about topics for uh, the future meetings. And with that, um, I think we can wrap up unless there's any other final comments from Jim or the committee. No, thank you very much. Very informative conversation and looking forward to seeing everyone tomorrow. Thanks, Caroline. All right. Thank you, everyone.